This, uh, I think, is a subset of what I want to talk about, but it's important to be mindful. There is what we might call the 3.45 billion year old reality, which is all organisms are made of carbon. And what we do, if we're bacteria on a petri dish going after sugar, or fruit flies in a fat flask going after mashed up banana, or we're deer without predators, we go after energy rich carbon. And we call that the 3.45 billion year old imperative. So starting 10,000 years ago, we had the gain control over our predators and over the things that want to eat us from the inside out. And we got at the first pool of energy rich carbon, the young pulverized coal of the soil. And we did it by starting the annual grain agriculture. And that made civilization possible. The second pool was 5,000 years, which sponsored the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, and we started using forests to smelt the ore for the bronze and the iron. And then 250 years ago, the Industrial Revolution made possible with coal. And short, we had been using natural gas for lighting, but we started using it for power um, about right after Drake's oil well in western Pennsylvania. And there ain't no more. This is all carbon. And what we now see is that the curve in which we went after the carbon, first of all through agriculture, then through the forests, then coal, then oil, and natural gas. That curve has shot up so that today, the 10-year-old has lived through 25% of all the oil ever burned. Now give us a sense of the species, of the speed, and it all began with agriculture. So, and here comes a most important part of my message. If we don't get sustainability in agriculture first, it's not going to happen. Because agriculture ultimately has a discipline standing behind it. Evolutionary biology and ecology stand behind agriculture. The material sector, the industrial sector has no discipline standing behind it to inform how to run on contemporary sunlight and cycle material. The processes that we have in nature's ecosystems that are real economies, and I want to talk now a little bit about the real economies. A forest is a real economy. There's nothing phony about a forest. Economy. It pays all bills. There's nothing phony about a grassland economy or an alpine meadow economy. But the economies that humans have are the economies like bacteria on a petri dish. Capitalism is nothing more than a race to the edge of a petri dish. And we solve our problems through growth. So if we're to figure out how to live within limits, we've got to look at nature's ecosystems as the standards um, to inform our conduct. So here is 
highly dense energy in a tank that runs our tractors, our combines, our agricultural equipment. And then here is the product of the most important invention of the 20th century. Two Germans, Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch, in 1909, figured out a way to turn atmospheric nitrogen. 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. It's N2, but it's one of the strongest bonds in nature. And they figured out how to turn atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia. And in so doing, using now natural gas as the feedstock, we have been able to expand the human population. Vaclav Smil, who has been an energy and nitrogen scholar during essentially all of his professional life, has concluded that without Haber Bosch, 40% of humanity wouldn't be here today. So the question is, as the natural gas runs out, will we be using wind machines in order to run Haber Bosch? As it stands, it looks like a possibility, but if we simply go for the industrial approach and don't try to build an agriculture based on the way nature's ecosystems work, then we're going to have the kind of soil erosion and poor management that we have with annual grains. So here's the story. Go back before 1960. Look at the blue line. The nitrogen uh, production and consumption has gone up. Uh, look at the red line. Irrigation has increased. And look at the green line. Phosphorus has gone up. Go back to 1948. Uh, the blue line has to do with production of pesticides. 1962 is Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Since Silent Spring and the warning of the harmful effects of pesticides, the production and sales has doubled and doubled again in spite of the accident at Bhopal, the fire in Switzerland, the thousands of deaths recorded and probably of the tens of thousands unrecorded. This is not a conspiracy. This is a worldview that goes back to an idea that began with the annual grain, which is nature is to be subdued or ignored if you're to have your food supply. So, here is a rainforest, a real economy. It features material recycling and runs on contemporary sunlight. Here is a desert scrub ecosystem. It features material recycling and runs on contemporary sunlight. This is a perennial polyculture. This is a perennial polyculture. And here is our Kansas prairie in the United States, a perennial polyculture. This is prairie land that has never been plowed. And as that prairie land will, during the grazing season, put on from 2.2 to 2.4 pounds per day 
and the only fossil fuel input is the wire for the fencing, the tractors, or the, uh, not the tractors, but the pickup trucks, and of course, formerly they used the horse. But there is a sustainable system, and that is the standard that we at the Land Institute look to to build an agriculture featuring perennials. We are about building a domestic grain producing prairie. So, to emphasize the importance of grains, I mentioned 70 percent of our agricultural acreage responsible for about 70 percent of the total calories that humans globally as well as in developed countries. This is Bruegel's 1565 painting called The Harvesters. One question is, is the wheat tall or are the people short? <laughs> it's probably both. The larger point though is, Look at the percentage of the agricultural landscape devoted to grain. There are pear trees there, there are apple trees, and in the original you can see people picking the pears and the apples. But notice that they have limbed up the trees to allow the light in for the grain. Because the trees in terms of calories are trivial. They're important from the point of view of nutrition. And they're important in that they are perennials. So we need trees. But the emphasis that I want to make with this is we're primarily grass seed eaters. And secondarily, legume seed eaters. Well, here is a profile of that prairie. Different root architectures there. And you saw the one uh, that is um, uh, just one of the examples uh, of, of one of the grasses. So if you look, say, in um, uh, well, if we were to say start on the left, um, the wheat plant on the left, that little plant, there it has been, in September is when the seeds were planted, it gets that side. On the right is our plant that we call Kernza, which is a relative of wheat that we, I should tell you, at the Land Institute were mostly plant breeders geneticist types, breeding perennial grains. So that's one of our plants, and there it is, uh, a photograph of it there. Uh, in June, at the time of harvest, uh, the wheat plant still has not got the root size. Meanwhile, the root of the perennial is there. And then come uh, September, at the time to plant, there's nothing covering the ground. So, here we are. Now, <clears throat> I already showed you this. That um, in that hierarchy of structure, we have been focusing primarily for the last you know, 400 years on being increasingly reductive. And what a big part of this talk is about is the necessity to embrace the ecosystem as the conceptual tool for the management of our uh, resources. So, but now for the breeding of the perennial grains. Uh, the Land Institute is about 600 acres. We have about 31 staff. Um, and uh, we're right in the heart of the country. Uh, we are working to uh, develop the perennial wheat on the left is the wheat plant. On the right is this uh, other plant here. There represents one of the hybrids in the middle. Uh, we do this work 
by making crosses in the greenhouse. Um, we look at chromosomes and we do what's called chromosome painting in order to identify where the various chromosomes came from. Um, this hap these happen to be this happens to be a back cross hybrid to the wheat plant. Uh, here you can see after harvest where the plants have been um, after harvest they've been cut off and here come the shoots. Those are perennials. That's good news. Unfortunately, we will throw away 95% of those plants, even those, no matter, they, they, they have to meet other tests. Uh, here are just uh, uh, some of the, uh, some 3,000 individual plants that uh, five pieces of data taken on each one of those plants uh, that has to do with certain virtues that we think are necessary. And here shows the grain. So, uh, corn has been the primary killer of the North American continent. More soil erosion with corn than any other crop until soybeans came on. Now, we've gone from 70 million acres of corn to 90 million acres of corn in one year as a result of the biofuels program, which is absolutely nuts. Or, to translate, crazy. Uh, <laughs> given the energy balance uh, so associated. Um, so, corn is going to be difficult. But, uh, uh, and I should say that when I first published on this in 1978, I said this is 50 to 100 years. Well, that seemed like a long time. But we're not going to solve global warming in 50 to 100 years. And we're not going to solve the population problem. So suddenly, we're in the short-range solution. We are looking to have this one plant on the left available, farmer-ready, but working with agronomists in nine years. Other species will be coming on. So sorghum, a very important plant in Africa. Um, we now have perennial and winter-hardy sorghum, but still a lot of breeding to do to get the yields up and some example of some of the uh, various sorghum crosses. Sunflower, a very important oil seed crop. It's clearly uh, within the top 20 of all crops. The plant on the left is an annual that was developed by the Native Americans. They did it twice, once in the southeastern United States, once in Mexico. Uh, we're crossing that annual on the left with the uh, perennial uh, native sunflower uh, on the right and some other species besides Maximilian. Uh, here's another group of relatives of the sunflower that uh, one of our geneticists is working on. But <coughs> if you note here how in early June, the annual still does not have a full canopy cover. So there's land that's bare. On the other hand, the perennial has a canopy cover, therefore is harvesting more sunlight, and therefore you get more yield. So we're now arguing that if you want to increase the food supply for humans are going to have to have the perennial. But it's going to take a long time. Uh, and we can talk about some of the time frames. Notice even in early July how the annual is slow to get a canopy cover. This, by the way, is with sorghum. So here are the various grain crops. The uh, intermediate wheat grass times the perennial wheat. We're supporting the upland rice, uh, perennial upland rice in China. 
Um, and two of our people go over every year and they report that the progress is good. Uh, perennial sorghum, perennial sunflowers, perennial legumes, and others. Here is the perennial rice in the Yunnan province. province. Um, and here are some of the places around the world where perennial grain research is now underway. Uh, several of there's a place in Nepal at the Nepal Agriculture Research Council uh, using some of our germplasm. Australia working on wheat. There you see Yunnan uh, in uh, China. Uh, Cornell University, University of Manitoba, Michigan State, Texas A&M, University of Georgia, and the Land Institute. Essentially, all of these places are using germplasm uh, that was developed at the Land Institute, and they there's beginning to get a, something of a head of steam. Uh, does it have legs? Does this possibility have legs? The idea of developing a perennial polyculture. In Australia, there was a conference held called Agriculture as a Mimic of Natural Ecosystems. So, um, as a result of our journey, uh, we felt bold enough to go to Washington and say, instead of five-year farm bills only, we need 50-year farm bills. Five-year farm bills, which of course come every five years, are essentially all devoted to the extractive economy. It's yield, it's bushels and acres. So they feature exports to help offset the balance of payment deficit for foreign oil. Uh, and that turns food into a commodity which then rewards, is rewarded through subsidies. There's a little bit in there on soil conservation. They'll throw a bone uh, toward soil conservation. And there, of course, are the food programs. But a 50-year farm bill begins with protecting the ecological capital. Protect the soil from erosion. Cut fossil fuel dependence to zero. And this, these roots sequester carbon. So, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and discovered America after the Native Americans had already discovered it and after the Vikings had already discovered it. Uh, but if one were to imagine the amount of carbon in the soils of, of uh, well, I'll say the United States minus Alaska and Hawaii, uh, in 1492 there was probably about 6% carbon. It's now about 3 So a big question is, how much carbon can we get back by sequestering, by reestablishing the perennial vegetative structure and it's been estimated by one of our staff members that somewhere between uh, 17 and 30 years worth of oil burning could be absorbed to get that back to 6% carbon. So it's not a the total solution to climate change, but would help mitigate some. Uh, managing nitrogen carefully. You see, what you have with the extensive root system is elegant micromanagement in millimeters and minutes. One reason we have problems with agriculture is because humans are poor managers of landscapes. We can't get down in there and manage the bacteria, the fungi, the earthworms, other invertebrates that make the system go. So agriculture destroyed 
so much of those natural systems. Then what do we do? Well, we try to compensate with crop rotations. Or we'll try to compensate by intensive manuring. Or in, I've heard many stories out of uh, people that have immigrated from Europe saying how at the bottom of the hill every year they carry the, the bottom furrow to the top of the hill with horses or draft animals and sometimes it was so steep they carried it themselves. So humans are terrible uh, managers of soils. So here shows the pie of the distribution of global ag acres. Cereals, oil seeds, and pulses, globally, 68%. Forages, 11%. Fruits and vegetables, 7%. Roots and tubers, 4%. 3% on other, fiber, 3%. Tree crops, 2%. Um, sugar crops, 2%. So, but look at the sustainable agriculture movement and the organic movement. What does it feature? Primarily fruits and vegetables. Yes, they're healthy, of course. They're diet, they're important. But meanwhile, the calories that feed humanity, uh, the systems that support them are eroding. So, what uh, we are proposing is a sustainable green revolution at 20-some places around the planet working on the various crops in the Philippines, China, Africa, Canada, Australia, Mexico, Turkey, India, Colombia, China, Canada, and in these places, what we would like to see is the development of young PhDs that are plant breeders, ecologists, uh, plant pathologists, agronomists, um, entomologists, as well as modelers to work in clusters with a 30-year goal. Working alongside those working on the short term with their short-term goals, but they have the long-term 30-year goal and yes, there will be leakage back and forth, but keep the eye on the ball for this long-term research agenda and young PhDs starting now will see it in their lifetime. I won't. I'm going to be working on the heart <laughs> and see if I can get good at it. <laughs> so, um, how much would this cost? Well, um, here is the idea about training the PhDs. Cohort 1, B stands for breeders plant breeders. A stands for agronomists and E stands for ecologists. So in co and so these people would be paid fifty thousand a year as students to get the PhD, thirty thousand salary, twenty thousand to support some of their research. And uh, cohort by the end of the third year, cohort one would be ready to hit the field. Cohort two, we'll have only 10 breeders, two agronomists, ecologists, cohort three, and so on, until over here we get more, um, uh, more people working in agronomy and ecology. But we need people that are trained and then go to places with the mission to build an agriculture that is as sustainable as the nature we destroy. How much did this cost? Over a 30 year period, under five billion. About 
the, co the subsidy on corn in the United States for one year. For ethanol, not all of it's ethanol, part of it is just the cattle and pig welfare program that we have. Um, well, we come back to nature's ecosystem, the prairie, as our standard. How are we going to manage this world? Nature's prairie is managed by fire and grazing. These are our bison on our prairie. Um, we also burn our prairie. Not every year. Doesn't have to be burned every year. But fire, grazing, and we don't have to use bison. We have domestic animals that are on the grassland. And what's important about the animal is that they are selective grazers. They don't just mow down everything. You need selective grazing, but you also need non-selective grazing. And that's non-selective grazing, man. <laughs> now, uh, what do we do with some of this? Well, it can be fed to livestock in a winter time, or it can go into selective, uh, non-selective grazers. But now I want to tell you a little story. Here is a perennial system being harvested with a non-selective grazer. Two horses. These are Amish in our uh, part of the world. In order to get the juice out of the stem, this machine is a crimper. And that crimper is run by a gasoline engine on this fork cart that turns the power of takeoff that will squeeze the juice out so that it will dry faster. Now, notice that we went from two horsepower to four horsepower to dry faster. The decisions in the future in the use of energy are going to come down to those kinds of considerations. So, Here's what, here's what I'm betting. That at various community levels, people will be deciding how much of their biomass they're willing to sacrifice in order to not have to have the extra energy costs for four horses versus two. We haven't even begun to think about those kind of details in industrial society yet. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report said, if we're going to save the wild biodiversity, we've got to intensify agriculture, whereas one ecologist said it's already screwed up. More fertilizer, more pesticides, more water, so that we don't keep encroaching onto the wild biodiversity of places like Brazil and elsewhere. So it's either production at the expense of conservation, or it's conservation at the expense of production. It's the dualism that goes all the way back to the Greeks and the Hebrews. It's an old dualism, and it is the dualism of the sacred of the wild and the profane, and it's in the Bible, in Genesis, condemned to deal with thistles and thorns and the sweat of the brow. 
That's in the Hebrew Bible. We, and by the time that Bible was written, we were already about, you know, six or seven thousand years into agriculture. So people knew we were already in a fallen condition. And then if you read the myth of Gilgamesh, it's the same, a similar story. <clears throat> now what is wonderful to think about is that in our time, in our time, you young people out here have the opportunity to be the most important generation in the history of human civilization to build an agriculture based on the way nature's ecosystems work. And the stakes are high because at best we have a holding action and we're going backwards. All you got to do is look at how much of the quality of the soil declines over the course of a century. We're arguing it's possible to have conservation as the consequence of production. And that means embracing the ecosystem concept and moving from that reductive end that uh, uh, Bacon and Descartes featured and that the Monsantos of the world feature. You see, this is a problem I have, my friends, with the sustainable ag movement and with the organic movement of which we're all a part. We will criticize the Monsantos for what they're doing. But what we don't get back to is how did that happen in the first place that they're able to make charters? And how did it happen that they are able to show, to validate what they're doing based on their fiduciary responsibility to stockholders? That gets back to petri dish economics. So in a way, we're flailing away. <laughs> rather than getting back to the basic underlying presuppositions of civilization. And so we then try to rein them in, just as we try to stop soil erosion by building terraces and grass waterways. Those are all uh, attempts to slow down the process of degradation. So. I come back to the importance of the ecosystem as the conceptual tool. So I'm about to finish. When we were hunters and gatherers, we were living within a natural ecosystem. We had predators that ate us. We had worms that devoured us from the inside out. Uh, fire is one of the ways we began to deal with our diseases. And then we started agriculture some 10,000 years ago. And we became a species out of context. So there's pre-industrial agriculture. In industrial agriculture, we even got even more out of context. But then we invent sustainable agriculture, and we praise ourselves for nicking away a little bit. So what are we going to do? Um, too much water has gone through the turbines to go back to gathering and hunting in a meaningful way with seven billion people. Uh, we're not going to do that. Pre-industrial agriculture, we're probably not going to willingly go back to. So we're saying it's possible to have natural systems agriculture that will not be perfect but it'll be closer to being uh, isomorphic. And here are some of our graduate fellows uh, that um, there, we, we say their purpose is to come to learn to be objective the right way. Uh, these are people that we supported in various universities around the country. They were doing the kind of research that we want. You know the problem? They don't have a place to go to work. <laughs> because the industrial mind 
dominates the universities. The industrial mind is predicated on bushels and acres. And Petri dish economics says, solve your problems through growth. And now we've got to say, how are we going to live within our means? So I began the lecture by saying that if we don't get sustainability in agriculture first, it's not going to happen. Agriculture has the potential to draw on ecology and evolutionary biology to inform a research agenda. The material sector, the industrial sector, doesn't have any economic, uh, there's no metaphors in the industrial economy. Just look, it's production, consumption, it's throughput, rather than 